And now back to Founders Keepers on the History Channel. I don't know, guys. I think a good preamble should start with, We the people of the United States. No, 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 no. It should obviously start like, Our name is the people and we're here to say... I say, I'm sorry I'm late, guys. It took forever to pack several weeks' worth of clothes, and let me tell you, boy, are my slaves tired. <laughs> Speaking of clothes, might I say I think everyone's wigs and tights and high heels and makeup are looking masculine as ever. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Rufus. Now let's get down to business. I'd like to get home in time to celebrate the 4th of July. Why the 4th of July? <laughs> Hey, I know you. you that jaywalking punk anarchist. The Founding Fathers. I feel like I hear about them all the time. Again, this is what the Founding Fathers actually warned us against. They should think well of the Founding Fathers. They th should think well of the Constitution. Most of our forefathers, all of our main Founding Fathers, were against slavery. Just imagine if social media was available to our Founding Fathers. These guys were national heroes. They literally created the United States. You know them, you love them. Like, let's sing that song we all learned in school where we name all of the founding fathers. Ready? Abraham Baldwin Gunning Bell for Jacob Broom, Pierce Butler Tate. Why aren't you singing? Okay, okay. Maybe we don't know all of the founding fathers, but we know some of them, right? Google says that there were seven main guys. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. And I know about these guys. Alexander Hamilton was known for his impressive singing and dancing abilities. And I know about George Washington from the money. And I know about Benjamin Franklin from, well, I never really had that kind of money, but I know about Benjamin Franklin from the cartoons. And John Adams, he's the guy on the beer, right? Or am I thinking of somebody else? And who can forget John Jay? Apparently you can, because that's not a picture of John Jay, that's Gunning Belford. This is John Jay. No, wait, wrong again, that's Pierce Butler. This is John Jay. No, of course not, it's John Oliver, the guy who I shamelessly stole this bit from. My point is, we don't really know too much about the Founding Fathers, not the seven supposed main guys, or the 39 who signed the Constitution, or the 55 delegates who were in the convention in Philadelphia writing the Constitution. So, like, who the heck were these guys? How were they chosen? Why did they write the Constitution? What were they trying to accomplish? I suppose that brings us to... An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution of the United States by Charles Beard, Dover Publications, published in 1913. If I want to figure out who the heck the Founding Fathers were, how they were chosen, why they wrote the Constitution, what they were trying to accomplish, this book seems like just the place to start to figure all that out. So let's jump into the text, starting with Chapter 1, Historical Interpretation in the United States. There are patriotic interpretations of the United States which glorify the whole affair. There are also supposed objective interpretations that try and take a sober, factual look at things. Beard determines that the most accurate interpretation of the creation of the United States would be one that looks at what tangible goals the founders had in mind and to what extent those goals were achieved. To this, Beard argues that a typical government is formed by the ruling classes of a society with two aims in mind. One, to keep the peace between various groups in society, and two, to protect the property and economic interests of that ruling class. He states, the primary object of a government, beyond the mere repression of physical violence, is the making of the rules which determine the property relations of members of society. The dominant classes, whose rights are thus to be determined, must perforce obtain from the government such rules as are consonant with the larger interests necessary to the continuance of their economic processes, or they must themselves control the organs of government. Basically, these two goals, keeping the peace between classes and protecting the economic interests of the ruling class, are either accomplished directly with an authoritarian government like a dictatorship or a monarchy, or when political power is shared with the public, then these goals are met through controlling the structures of that government, thus shaping how the government is run and whose interests are most represented. From this, Beard argues that lofty ideas like general welfare and justice were probably not the guiding force leading the Founding Fathers to craft the U.S. Constitution, but rather, it was economic advantages which played the primary role. Okay, so what were the economic interests at the time? This brings us to Chapter 2, A Survey of Economic Interests in 1787. Basically, if governments arise through the dominant economic classes seeking gains and protections in their favor, Beard wants to discover what economic groups would have benefited from the overthrow of the old system, the Articles of Confederation, and the establishment of a new government with the U.S. Constitution. 
Hello, everyone. I have traveled hundreds of miles and taken weeks off of work so that I may represent the poor farmers and laborers in the drafting of this new constitution. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, there were certain classes of people not represented at the convention. As Beard states, the slaves, the indentured servants, the mass of men who could not qualify for voting under the property tests imposed by the state constitutions and laws, and women disenfranchised and subjected to the discriminations of the common law, these groups were, therefore, not represented in the convention which drafted the Constitution. Well, of course not. Women lack the emotional control to participate in government, and the swarthy and savage races lack the mental fortitude for it. And of the Anglo-Saxon Protestants, surely only one with some stock in the nation should have a say in its governance. I own a substantial estate, and therefore have a substantial investment in the health and well-being of this great nation. Therefore, it is natural and good that my interests should play the primary role in the designing of a government. Okay, so wealthy white male landowners and slave owners and such were the primary members of society represented in the writing of the Constitution. I suspect you already knew that. Beard takes a more data-driven look at these folks looking at the distribution of land holdings, loans, securities, manufacturing establishments, and land to the West, all the material conditions type stuff, and what impact the new constitution had on them. Of property owners, Beard states, The real property holders may be classified into three general groups. The small farmers, particularly back from the seacoast scattered from New Hampshire to Georgia, the manorial lords, such as we find along the banks of the Hudson, and the slaveholding planters of the South. Beard argues that of these groups, the small farmers were probably most opposed to the new constitution, as they were probably debtors and sympathetic to things like Shays' Rebellion. For those who don't know, Shays' Rebellion was this event where thousands of poor farmers and Revolutionary War veterans came together to basically say, Hey, what the hell? We risked our lives to get out from under the thumb of the British Empire only to be put under the thumb of wealthy creditors and landowners? Let's annihilate the debts! Maybe then we can afford some clothes. We kicked out the strongest empire in the world. We can kick out these rich jerks as well. Power to the people! And these few thousand folks stormed an armory in an attempt to overthrow the government. The government at the time was unable to finance soldiers to stop them, so a privately funded militia was used to help put down the rebellion. But okay, okay, that's poor farmers to the west. The plantation owners in the south and the wealthy landowners in the northeast on the other paw might have been the most supportive of a new constitution because they wanted a strong federal government for dealing with domestic disturbances such as slave revolts and Shays' Rebellion and things like that. But it wasn't just landowners that sought to gain from a new government, but capital owners as well, those who owned loans and stocks and securities and such. Beard argues that money capital was suffering under the lack of federal protection for manufacturers and distributors and various laws and acts depreciating the currency. However, this was going to change under the new constitution, where large financial goals were more secure and achievable under a stronger federal government. In summation, the two main groups calling for a new constitution were wealthy landowners and plantation owners, and those who owned what Beard calls personality, which is an old day term that essentially means capital, referring to people who owned manufacturing and shipping and stocks and securities and loans and such. As Beard puts it, if we may judge from the politics of the Congress under the Articles of Confederation, two related groups were most active. Those working for the establishment of a revenue sufficient to discharge the interests and principle of the public debt, and those working for commercial regulations advantageous to personality operations in shipping and manufacturing and in Western land speculations. Chapter 3. The Movement for the Constitution So, there were two main groups who wanted a new government, landowners and the owners of capital. But what kinds of things actually got the ball rolling? Well, if you're all caught up on your Crash Course U.S. History, the following information might sound pretty familiar. The Articles government was a complete disaster for exactly one reason. It could not collect taxes. Both the national government and the individual states had racked up massive debt to pay for the war, and their main source of revenue became tariffs. But because Congress couldn't impose them, states had to do it individually. And this made international trade a total nightmare, a fact worsened by the British being kind of cranky about us winning the war and therefore unwilling to trade with us. In 1786 and 1787, the problem got so bad in Massachusetts that farmers rose up and closed the courts to prevent them from foreclosing upon their debt-encumbered farms. This was called Shays Rebellion after Revolutionary War veteran and indebted farmer Daniel Shays. The uprising was quelled by the state militia, but for many, this was the sign that the Articles government, which couldn't deal with the crisis at all, had to go. Beard argues, The failure of repeated attempts in Congress to secure an amendment authorizing the laying of impost duties, the refusal of the states to pay the requisitions made by Congress, and the obvious impossibility of gaining their ends through the ordinary channels of ratification by state legislatures, drove the advocates of these measures to desperation. 
Basically, there was some big government stuff that the big money movers and shakers were struggling to do under the Articles of Confederation, such as fees on imported items, creating federal laws, and collecting taxes to achieve these big government goals. So they wanted to create a new and stronger federal government to achieve those ends. To make matters worse for them, as we've already discussed, enter Shay's Rebellion, and how a privately funded militia was required to put down that rebellion. And it wasn't going to end things there. Slave revolts, labor unrests, wars with Native Americans, westward expansion, folks with a lot of material wealth to lose from these various disturbances wanted a stronger federal government at their disposal to deal with things. And Beard concludes, Large and important groups of economic interests were adversely affected by the system of government under the Articles of Confederation. Having failed to realize their great purposes through the regular means, the leaders in the movement set to work to secure, by a circuitous route, the assembling of a convention to revise the Articles of Confederation with the hope of obtaining, outside of the existing legal framework, the adoption of a revolutionary program. Chapter 4, Property Safeguards in the Election of Delegates So, if the goal was to revise or revolutionize the current government, how were the folks chosen to do so, well, chosen? It wasn't through a general election process. No, the Founding Fathers were not voted on by the general public. Instead, the delegates were chosen by state legislatures. Okay, so who were these state legislatures? Well, who could be a state legislature was restricted by property and wealth qualifications and various rules around race and gender and religion in the state constitutions of 1787. To give just a few examples from the text, the New Hampshire Constitution stated, No person shall be capable of being elected a senator who is not of the Protestant religion and seized of a freeholding estate in his own right of the value of 200 pounds or what is about $5,000 today. In New Jersey, members of the legislature had to be worth at least £1,000 proclamation money, or real or personal estate within the same county, or what is around $32,000 today. In North Carolina, you had to have at least 100 acres of land to qualify for public office. In Georgia, you had to have 250 acres of land, or property valued at £250, or just over $7,000 in today's money. To all of this, Beard concludes, From this review, it is apparent that a majority of the states placed direct property qualifications on the voters, and the other states eliminated practically all who were not taxpayers. Meaning that, there were safeguards ensuring that the wealthiest interests in society were represented. Folks who owned stocks, public securities, manufacturing, and or large land holdings were the only citizens allowed to choose the delegates sent to Philadelphia, aka the ones who became the Founding Fathers. Chapter 5, The Economic Interests of the Members of the Convention Okay, after looking at the economic and political interests of the time and looking at who was able to vote to be elected to state office and thus choose delegates sent to Philadelphia, we are now ready to take a look at who the heck these founding fathers were. Putting some basic two and two together, Beard asks, Did the men who formulated the fundamental law of the land possess the kind of property which were immediately and directly increased in value or made more secure by the results of their labors at Philadelphia? Did they have money at interests? Did they own public securities? Did they hold western lands for appreciation? Were they interested in shipping and manufacturers? Well, let's look at the available data. And by let's, I mean Beard already did that, and I'm just going to go over a few examples he brings up. Starting with, John Blair of Virginia appears frequently in the fiscal transactions between the federal government and the Virginia Loan Office. In 1778, Blair himself turned in nearly $1,000 worth of paper money on the United States loan, something like $24,000 today. David Beerley of New Jersey was the grandson of John Beerley, who owned 1,600 acres of land near Newton, New Jersey, a 100-acre plantation on the Delaware, besides several thousand acres of land near Lawrenceville. Pierce Butler of South Carolina was a large slaveholder, having 31 in his possession at the time of the first census. And of course, Rufus Dogson of Georgia, the young nation's primary biscuit manufacturer, inherited over 500 acres of farmland where he built up the personality of his sprawling biscuit manufacturing and distribution empire. Regarding public securities, Beard states, Of the 55 members who attended, no less than 40 appear on the records of the Treasury Department for sums varying from a few dollars up to more than $100,000, what is between $100 and over $3 million in today's money. On top of all this, 14 members had lands for speculation, 24 members had money loaned at interest, 11 members owned mercantile manufacturing and shipping lines, and 15 members owned slaves. Out of 55 founding fathers, this is not exactly a cross-section of the country as a whole. No, when it comes to representation, the founding fathers skewed heavily to the interests of the rich and powerful. But uh, yeah, the founding fathers were a bunch of rich landowners and slave owners and such, you knew that. 
What's more important to Beard's argument is whether or not these men had the means, intelligence, and desire to form a government that supported and improved their economic interests. Which brings us to Chapter 6, The Constitution as an Economic Document. Between October 1787 and August 1788, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay wrote 85 essays called the Federalist Papers, intended to outline the goals of and to encourage the ratification of the new Constitution. In Federalist Number 10, Madison wrote, The regulation of these various and interfering interests forms the principal task of modern legislation. The most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors fall under a like discrimination. In modern-day layman's terms, the main goal of government is to protect the various social classes from each other, like those who own land from those who don't, and those who are creditors from those who are debtors. So, the Founding Fathers wanted to create a stronger federal government to achieve their goals, to advance their political and economic interests, and to protect themselves from the political and economic interests of social classes opposite themselves. So, what did this new federal government have the power to do? Beard names four main powers granted to the new government. 1. The power to collect taxes. He states, Under the Articles, Congress had no power to lay and collect taxes immediately. It could only make requisitions on the state legislatures. Under the new system, however, Congress is authorized to lay taxes on its own account. 2. The power to create a military. This was for defensive wars, of course, but also offensive wars, like against other countries and indigenous tribes to gain territories and expand the nation westward also to be used domestically to put down various rebellions such as slave revolts, debtors' revolts, and labor uprisings. 3. The power over interstate commerce. In other words, to engage in protectionism and free markets within the U.S. and with other nations as deemed most beneficial to U.S. interests. Or as Beard explains it, the Constitution vests in Congress plenary control over foreign and interstate commerce and thus authorizes it to institute protective and discriminatory laws in favor of American interests and to create a wide sweep for free trade throughout the whole American empire. 4. The power to regulate territories or incorporate them into the United States. AKA to allow for the acquisition of territories, westward expansion, removal of Native Americans, Trail of Tears, all that kind of stuff. Explaining the goals achieved by these four main powers granted to the new government, Beard states, Through them, public creditors may be paid in full domestic peace maintained, advantages obtained in dealing with foreign nations, manufacturers protected, and the development of the territories go forward with full swing. And Beard concludes, The concept of the Constitution as a piece of abstract legislation, reflecting no group interests and recognizing no economic antagonisms, is entirely false. It was an economic document drawn with superb skill by men whose property interests were immediately at stake. Chapter 7, The Political Doctrines of the Members of the Convention If the Constitution was this economic document written primarily to achieve the economic interests of the wealthy of the time, what was the justification, the political doctrine of these founding fathers, to do this? Well, from here, Beard goes through like 40 different founding fathers quoting their views on class and economics and government, particularly their skepticism about democracy and the general public. I'm not going to go over each one of them here, because then I might as well be reading you the entire book, so here are some that stood out to me. Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts stated, The evils we experience flow from the excesses of democracy. The people do not want virtue, but are the dupes of pretended patriots. Alexander Hamilton of New York sang, All communities divide themselves to the few and the many. The first are the rich and well-born, the other the mass of the people. The people are turbulent and changing. They seldom judge or determine right. Give, therefore, to the first class a distinct and permanent share in the government. They will check the unsteadiness of the second. F.J. Mercer of Maryland stated, The people cannot know and judge of the characters of candidates. The worst possible choice will be made. Roger Sherman of Connecticut stated, the people immediately should have as little to do as may be about the government. They want information and are constantly liable to be misled. And Rufus Dogson of Georgia stated, The public are free to choose between bacon biscuits and chicken biscuits. I personally like to eat both at once, nom nom nom. But the public should not be trusted to elect the highest offices in the land. That would be way too risky for my biscuit empire. Cough cough, I mean for this great nation. 
So yeah, despite creating, for the time, a fairly liberal democracy, the Founding Fathers actually had pretty anti-democratic views. So it's no surprise that the interests of the dominant economic classes took a front row seat, while the general public initially could only directly vote for one half of one of the three branches of government. Chapter 8, The Process of Ratification Beard summarizes the ratification of the Constitution in this way. On the 17th day of September, 1787, the convention at Philadelphia finished its work and transmitted the new Constitution to Congress. Eleven days later, on September 28th, the Congress, then sitting in New York, resolved to accept the advice of the convention and sent the Constitution to the state legislatures to be transmitted by them to conventions chosen by the voters of the respective commonwealths. Ah, oh, jeez, that just sounds like a coup d'etat with extra steps. Warner Brothers, that was my audition to be the new voice of Morty. Hit me up if you'd like to make an offer. Anyways, back to the text. It wasn't a surefire victory for the Founding Fathers, however. As Beard puts it, even after powerful influences had been brought to bear, the margin for the Federalists was uncomfortably close, 187 to 168. Not only this, Beard adds, for a long time after, the war of the dissenters against the Constitution went on in Pennsylvania, breaking out in occasional riots, and finally in the Whiskey Rebellion in Washington's administration. But they were at length beaten, outgeneraled and outclassed in the arts of political management. This brings us to Chapter 9, The Popular Vote on the Constitution. Here, Beard discusses the barriers to ratifying the Constitution. Well, there was no popular vote on the Constitution, of course. Instead, delegates were chosen who could then choose to ratify the new Constitution, which needed to pass in nine of the 13 congressional votes in order to be adopted. This already limited process was made more limited because elections were often held very early to ensure favorability to the Federalists over their detractors. As one account recalled, the election for members of the convention was held at so early a period, and the want for information was so great, that some of us did not know of it until after it was over. Not only this, poor laborers and farmers, typically most opposed to the new constitution, would have had to take time away from work and travel long distances in winter conditions to access the vote, something they were not likely to be able to do. Excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. You are just barely qualified to vote on a delegate to weigh in on this new constitution. How do you plan to vote? Oh, well, you see, I tell you what, I don't like this new constitution not one bit, but I'm very busy. I've got to harvest the rest of this barley here so my sons and farm hand can go feed the pigs, and I've got to recultivate the western field for planting winter vegetables, and I have to mend the coop door some coyotes busted trying to get my geese. Besides that, one of the Johnson boys from down the way told me the road's been washed out since the big rain we had a few weeks back, so I don't think I could get to the vote anyways. Beard adds, it is highly probable that not more than one-fourth or one-fifth of the adult white males took part in the election of delegates to the state conventions. If anything, this estimate is high. At all events, the disenfranchisement of the masses through property qualifications and ignorance and apathy, and of course race and gender and such, contributed largely to the facility with which the personality interest representatives carried the day. The latter were alert everywhere, for they knew, not as a matter of theory, but as a practical matter of dollars and cents, the value of the new constitution. To all this, Beard concludes, the debtors everywhere waged war against the constitution. Of this, there is plenty of evidence, but they had no money to carry on their campaign. They were poor and uninfluential. The strongest battalions were not on their side. The wonder is that they came so near to defeating the constitution at the polls. Chapter 10, the economics of the vote on the constitution. Keeping the limits on voting in mind, let's look at how the different economic sectors voted regarding sending delegates to vote on the new constitution. Here is just one example. In Massachusetts, the eastern and western sections voted predominantly for the constitution, while the middle section voted predominantly against it. With Beard stating, the middle section of Massachusetts represented the interior agricultural interests of the state, small farmers. From this section came a large part of the Shays faction in 1786. Beard adds, 22 of the 24 men from Boston and Suffolk County who voted in favor of the ratification of the Constitution in the Massachusetts Convention were holders of public securities, and all of the 22 except two, Wales and Warren, probably benefited from the appreciation of the funds which resulted from the ratification. Basically, going off the data Beard provides, this seems to be essentially the case everywhere in the country. Areas populated by wealthy property and personality owners voted in favor of the Constitution, while areas populated by poor farmers voted against it. Well, those who could even access the vote anyways. Of this collection of data, Beard concludes, 
holders of personality, saw in the new government a strength and defense to their advantage. The opposition to the constitution almost uniformly came from the agricultural regions, and from the areas in which the debtors had been formulating paper money and other depreciatory schemes. And finally, chapter 11, the economic conflict over ratification as viewed by contemporaries. When looking at the constitution, folks often want to focus on the structure of the government, the branches and the checks and balances and such, or they want to look at the rights and liberties granted to citizens through things like the Bill of Rights and all that. But what did the people at the time find most noteworthy? Well, James Madison wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson stating, The articles relating to treaties, to paper money, and to contracts created more enemies than all the errors in the system, positive and negative, put together. Okay, so despite how we might look at it now, the biggest conflicts seem to be along the lines of class warfare, between wealthy landowners and poor farmers, between creditors and debtors, what Beard has been focusing on throughout the text. Beard states, The members of the Philadelphia Convention which drafted the Constitution were, with a few exceptions, immediately, directly, and personally interested in and derived economic advantages from the establishment of the new system. Well, so what if I benefited from the ratification of the new constitution? It's only logical. If we want to have a strong, prosperous nation, it only follows that such a nation should be built to protect the interests of biscuit magnates. And it makes sense that such interests prevailed, since very few citizens voted for ratification, either due to disenfranchisement, indifference, or due to lack of accessibility or information. As Beard states, the constitution was ratified by a vote of probably not more than one-sixth of the adult males. Oh, phew, if only I was able to get to the polls. Beard ultimately concludes, The leaders who supported the Constitution in the ratifying conventions represented the same economic groups as the members of the Philadelphia Convention, aka the Founding Fathers, and, in a large number of instances, they were also directly and personally interested in the outcome of their efforts. Next time on Founders Keepers. Smart move putting that Bill of Rights in there last minute. I don't know if we would have gotten this thing ratified without it. It's the Bill of Rights and it's here to say. I just worry it's not catchy enough. <laughs> I'm just glad we're going to be able to get a tax base together to fund a standing army to protect my biscuit interests and expand grain plantations into the Western territories. I say, hey, sure, not so loudly now. I've got slaves packing up my wigs in the other room. Oh, quit hounding me. <laughs> Conclusion. Patriotic folks seem to think the Founding Fathers were like this. Oh, liberty, I love liberty and democracy, not to mention justice and enlightenment values. But of course, I just read Common Sense by Thomas Paine for the third time this year. Oh, I meant to give that one a second reading, but I ended up just watching the Radical Reviewer video on it instead. The what? Yeah, never mind, never mind. Uh, by the way, have I told you how much I hate tyranny and love liberty and justice? But despite what speeches from federal government officials or Fox News might have you believe about the Founding Fathers, they were not divinely inspired geniuses with pure goals of freedom and justice guiding them. In stark contrast to this view, other folks seem to think the Founding Fathers were more like this. Hee <laughs> hee I'm a rich, racist, imperialist, capitalist, sexist, patriarchal, slave-owning white male. Hee <laughs> hee, me too. Let's get together and make a government that's pro-racism and sexism and slavery and all imperialist and such. Ha <laughs> ha Yeah, let's do it. That will be so evil. Mwah! No, although it's good that many folks are discovering that the Founding Fathers weren't these mythical heroes that they were raised to believe them to be, let's make sure that we aren't creating mythology in the other direction. The truth is, it would seem to be that the Founding Fathers were actually more like this. I'm not a pinnacle of good or evil, I'm just a guy like everybody else. I see problems with this current government under the Articles of Confederation, particularly in collecting taxes, paying debts, and raising an army for domestic and international affairs. I want to ameliorate these problems and create a stronger, better, more prosperous nation. Because I am limited and motivated by my personal interests and perspectives, creating a stronger, better, more prosperous nation to me means protecting commerce, recuperating debts for collectors, and ensuring protection of private property in battles with Native Americans or rebelling slaves or in labor uprisings. Um, what the hell are you talking like that for? Sorry, I just smoked a big pipe full of marijuana I brought from my plantation. I'm feeling very meta, very introspective. Anyways, did you bring that hemp paper for us to draft a new constitution on? Yep, yep, I got it right here. Let's hammer this thing out. Yeah, as an anarcho-communist type pup, 
I've always found material conditions, concrete economic outcomes, to be a pretty effective predictor of people's actions. And it seems to be no different here with the Founding Fathers and the writing of the Constitution and the creation of the United States. So, if you'd like to understand the economic factors which led to the creation of and the formation and structures of the U.S. Constitution, if you would like a better understanding of the economic motivations of the Founding Fathers, then I recommend An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution of the United States by Charles Beard. Anyway, as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Your tremendous support has allowed me to get dog insurance, which is wonderful. You've allowed me to support other creators I couldn't otherwise support. Just gotta love that. You provide me with a little extra funds for books and dog toys and things like that, which is really awesome. I appreciate you folks a lot. And if you like what I do here and you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radical reviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the radical reviewer. Thanks for watching. Gave some of you back some freedom with my silly bill of rights. You saw the proper language so you wouldn't rise to fight. I fooled y'all with imagery, now look what I've become. And that's about the only thing the governments have done. Yes, I fought long and hard to secure my place on top. With bombs and tanks and crack cocaine and violence from the cops. I kept you apathetic and this is how I've won. And that's about the only thing the governments have done. Yeah, that's about the only thing the governments have done. There are big decisions to be made. I'll sign anything.